said he'd been looking for the police. And the police said, well, we've been looking for you. And how you been looking for us when we be in the same spot? Hey guys, what's up? Welcome back to the channel. My name is Kennedy. If you're new here, if you're not new, hey girl, how have you been? Who is Carlin? Welcome back to the channel, you guys. I am fighting for my... I hate when you open Netflix and it just start talking. Like I, like I was saying, I'm fighting for my life to get my work done and to do the things I need to do because they keep canceling school for the threat of inclement weather. The inclement weather never comes. But with Christmas break included, my kids have been out of school. They have not had a full entire week, Monday through Friday of school in six weeks. Six weeks. How the hell are we supposed to get anything done with these children running around? I really don't know. I don't know. But before we hop into today's case, I started an Instagram and a TikTok specifically for hair. And that's where I'm going to start posting like mostly hair and like beauty short form content. I'm also going to keep up with like um, the beauty. Blue. Can I talk? Damn, it's been so long since I talked to the camera. That's where I'm gonna keep up with the beauty room updates and I would love for you guys to follow that page. If you're interested in more of like the beauty, the hair of it all, that'll be over there short form and then obviously on the second channel long form. I know y'all have been dying for like hair care info and a silk press routine. I have not washed my hair since Christmas. I'm trying to wait for the kids to go back to school so I can like have a day to film it. They cancel school again tomorrow. Like I'm just fighting for my life. But anyway, we're gonna hop into today's case. No makeup today. Obviously my makeup is already done. We went into New Orleans and had like a day trip. I'm full, but I'm still filming and that is what's important, okay? <laughs> it is September of 2012 and we are in Chicago, Illinois at about 4.30 in the morning when homicide detectives are called out to the scene of a shooting that happened in an apartment complex. But if you're from the South like me, we don't have a lot of apartment complexes that are like, I don't know what I'm even trying to say. How do I explain it? I don't. Like that are buildings, you know, like you have to have a code to get into the door and then you walk into a building. We don't really have that a lot where I'm from in Louisiana. Like we have like gated communities, but this is like a building, a complex. The first floor is like commercial and then the upper levels are like the resident. Y'all know what I'm talking about. Ciao. So bad to say it wasn't cheap okay it was a nicer expensive luxury apartment and whoever had done the shooting had to be able to like get into the building in the first place you know it wasn't like they could just knock on somebody's door or break right in you know they had to have access to the building their victim was 45 year old yolanda holmes who had been shot and stabbed in her bed while she was asleep she was a single mom to a 23 year old son and a salon owner, she did hair. And from what I could tell, she was a very like self-made woman. She did very well for herself through her hair salon business. And she was able to even give back to the community. She would do like back to school drives and giveaways. She was really a pillar in her community. Everybody loved Yolanda, who doesn't love their hairdresser? But Miss Yolanda lived on the fourth floor of this apartment complex and inside of her apartment, the scene is gruesome to say the least. There's like blood everywhere, up and down the halls, on the walls. Like there was some sort of something going on that happened in the entirety of the apartment outside of her being attacked in her sleep. There was no signs of forced entry, no tampering with the door. Whoever got in was let in or had a key. And the crime scene is just weird. On top of Yolanda being deceased and attacked in her bed, it's obvious that she never got out of bed like she was asleep when this happened because of the way that she was found. But then there are signs of like this brawl being carried out in the outer portion of the apartment. 
And then they find the gun that was used in the attack, but it's kind of like broken up into a bunch of pieces on the ground. It's an older revol revolver, but guns don't just fall apart, you know? So they're kind of confused as to why the gun is in a thousand pieces, not a thousand pieces, I mean dramatic, but in a bunch of pieces on the ground. Now, Miss Yolanda was not in the home by herself. She was there with her, I don't want to say on again, off again boyfriend. His name is Curtis Watts. They had not been together, but had recently reconciled or it seems like at the very least they were just having like maybe one last night together type of situation on the night of the attack. They had not been together. Nobody was expecting him to be at the house, okay? Now, they question Curtis, who is also very badly beaten up, but he is alive, okay? Curtis says that he was woken up to Yolanda being attacked. But when they're questioning him about exactly, you know, what may have happened, he doesn't really have a straight story. However, they're unsure if Curtis is like mentally not there because of the attack that he just went through. There was obviously some sort of brawl inside the house or at the very least it was staged to look like that. And he was bleeding from the head. Like he had been beaten up, something happened child. Somebody beat him up. So they're not sure if you know he's concussed or if he's lying, you know? This is totally unrelated, but I told y'all we went into New Orleans today. I got a concussion playing volleyball in New Orleans when I was like younger in high school. <laughs> and for whatever reason, after that volleyball tournament, like I couldn't finish playing, obviously. We went out to eat afterwards and there's a picture of me like in my volleyball jersey sitting at this restaurant with a bandage on my head like eyes barely open why we went out to eat i don't know but if i can find that picture i'm gonna put it in because it's hilarious why would we go out to eat after that i slammed my head on a concrete floor because it was like underground in a hotel and they had basically set up volleyball courts in this like basement town i don't know anyway back to the case they don't know if curtis is concussed or lying okay and they choose to send him in to the hospital and question him later while they continue to comb through their crime scene. After that, they notice a few more things at the crime scene. A, there is a knife missing from the knife block, but it's like the smaller fruit knife. It's not one of the big knives, you know, like you would take and peel an apple in your hand, a little bitty knife that's missing. And they don't find it at the scene, so they can't say whether or not this was the weapon that was used. But they do notice that the knife is missing. They also find a string, like a piece of somebody's headphones, you know, like headphones, headphones, well, earbuds with the wires, you know, that go in your ear and then come down. It's just like the earpiece and then a piece of the wire as if it was like snatched off somebody's ear or something like that. Somebody is walking around missing a piece of their earbuds. Family and friends were notified at the scene because obviously the police taped all those things. They started to cause a commotion and draw a crowd. Her son eventually arrived on the scene to kind of just figure out what's going on. He asked to go up and see his mom and that is how he found out that his mom was the reason that they were all here. And her son, 23-year-old Kwame, he and her were very close because it was just the two of them. And mainly because his father was doing time in prison for a double homicide. Yeah. So right off the bat, there's a couple different angles for them to look into. Like, was this murder related to the two murders that his father had committed? Like, it's a bunch of places for detectives to start. But they start with questioning Curtis after he got out of the hospital. He wasn't like in the hospital. He got a couple stitches. He was fine. So they talked to him about the night prior to the murder. What's going on? What's going down? What happened? He tells them that they had recently started spending time together again, that they went out and had a little date that night, came home, got cozy, if you know what I mean, and then went to bed, you know? A nice, normal, perfect night for them. He said nothing was out of the ordinary until he was woken up to the gunshots. He says that him and this gunman were basically just tearing it down. That's how the apartment got so so messy, you know? That's what happened. Him and this him and this gunman had duped it out and then eventually that the gunman just walked out after 
they fought for a while. Literally, that was his words. He said they fought for a while and then the gunman just walked out the front door. And outside of that, Curtis says he doesn't really know what or why it happened. He says he did not recognize this person. They were kind of covered up. He said they were about six foot tall, but he didn't really know outside of that. They also questioned Curtis about um, cleaning. He had cleaned up, he had washed off his hands and his feet. There was blood in the sink. And he had also waited 14 minutes to call 911. And when it came to all these things, you know, they have lots of questions and Curtis has no answers. To say that, you know, he was in the apartment fighting off this masked attacker, what really happened? So detectives are just really confused and of course they're suspicious of Curtis right away. And they're wondering if Miss Yolanda was stabbed and shot. Remember they found the gun broken up. They're wondering if Curtis had originally planned on shooting her some kind of way, broke his gun and then stabbed her and then staged the crime scene to look like he had gotten beat up because otherwise they just don't have any great explanation. But they also don't have much concrete evidence to prove their theory. Also through DNA testing, what they find out is that in the apartment, the blood that is not inside of the bedroom is all Curtis's. It's all Yolanda's blood in the bedroom, all of Curtis's blood in the rest of the apartment. No mixing, no mingling. They don't find any foreign DNA. So they're like, you know, Curtis, if you're saying you and this masked gunman duped it out, y'all were fighting so bad, you were this bloody, where the hell is his blood? Where, where is it at? Confusing. But again, this is not enough to pin somebody with murder. They need more concrete evidence, with a, which they just don't have a lot of. So next they turn to knocking on doors, asking people in the neighboring apartments what they had heard. And they also look into surveillance footage because this is a nicer hotel. There's hotel apartment, there's a lot of cameras. And what they do and what they see from surveillance footage that they think gives them a new suspect and maybe kind of verifies Curtis's story is that they see a man go into the apartment complex. He gets buzzed in right before the murder takes place. And what they realize is that he walks in with AirPods, earpods whatever the hell you, earphones, whatever. Get on time out, ciao. He walks in with those. But when he walks out shortly after the murder, okay, he's wearing the same headphones, but they're missing a piece. He's missing a chunk of his headphones. And so they're thinking, okay, girl, maybe there was somebody else in this apartment that night since they found the other piece of the headphones. But what they realize is that this intruder, he left 14 minutes before Curtis called 911. So there was a 14 minute lapse in time. What was Curtis doing for this 14 minutes? If he, you know what I'm saying? What was going on Curtis? Were you involved or were you not involved? Why didn't you call 911 right away? But Curtis kind of stops helping with the investigation. He no longer corroborates cooperates so what they decide to do is bring in her son Kwame and his not his sister Yolanda's sister to get info on Miss Yolanda's life if she had any enemies anybody stalking her that kind of thing and what they found out from her family is that Curtis seemingly was the problem most importantly, what they learned from her sister is that they were having a little get together at Yolanda's apartment about five months prior to her death, okay? And Curtis was at this party. It was mostly Yolanda's family. And for some reason, Curtis flew off the handle in like a jealous rage. He smashed Yolanda's TV. But this is a party full of Yolanda's friends and family. So he not about to step to her in front of all these people. You know, it was, he was about to get jumped. Yeah, uh -huh. he quickly realized that he could not take everybody, so he threatened. So he threatened to go to his car and shoot that bitch up. For lack of better terms, he threatened to air that motherfucker out. So they called 911, and he was scooped up by police. Okay. Uh mm -hmm. And again, this is alarming, but not evidence. You know what I'm saying? And like I said, Curtis isn't really involved in the investigation anymore. He takes a big step back. 
Um, what they decided to do is to try to see if anybody could identify the man who was seen with the earphones going in and out of the building right before and right after the murder, but nobody knows who this guy is. But luckily they're able to bring Curtis back in and they offer him a polygraph test and he accepts, okay? He's willing to take a polygraph test to try to clear his name because he swears he is not involved. He fails, every question. But again, this is not concrete evidence. It's not enough to arrest him. What's even more alarming to detectives is that when it's time for Yolanda's funeral, Curtis is the only person close to her who is not in attendance. And while he doesn't show up to the funeral, he starts being in constant contact with the detectives on the case, asking them if they have any new suspects or what exactly is going on with the investigation. So it's like you were concerned enough to call the detectives working on the case, but you couldn't bring your butt to the funeral. Interesting. So the only thing they can do is kind of wait for pieces of concrete evidence to surface themselves. And the main piece of evidence that they want is the cell phone records because whoever had come into the building, this man with the earbuds who left minus one earbud, he had to call to be let into the building. He had to call Yolanda, okay? Why does it take 12 months to get these phone records back? 12 months. Whew, I bundled up because it's freezing in here, but I like to sleep in an ice box, so it's too late to turn on the heater. If I turn on the heater now, it's gonna be too hot to go to sleep. Anyway, so 12 months to get this cell phone record information back, and what they see is, is that Yolanda has two cell phones, like two numbers on her account. And one number is Yolanda's number that she uses every day, like her everyday cell phone number. And they don't know who this other number belongs to. And what's alarming about this secondary number is that they had contact with this one other number before the murder, during the murder, after, but never talked to this number again. And this also pulls up a red flag for them because remember the person who was seen in the building on camera with the earphones? They're wondering if this person was using earphones because they were on the phone with this secondary number during the time of the murder. So they're trying to figure out who this secondary be number belongs to, like what person in her life that this number belongs to. But when they reach out to Kwame, he has kind of fallen off the face of the earth. Okay, he moved out of Chicago to the suburbs. Um, he hadn't really been talking to his family. But what detectives find out is that he hadn't really needed anybody because he received a large life insurance payout after his mother's death. Yeah, yep, that's where this is about to go. Her son, mm -hmm. And what they then realized is that the secondary phone number was the first phone number that Kwame had given to police after a secondary interview and after every interview after that, he had given them another number and remember, this was like a year after the fact, that first number he had given to them was like in some paperwork tossed to the side that they had started combing through, trying to identify the secondary number. Boom, Kwame was the one who at the time had this secondary number, the secondary phone that was on the phone with somebody else during the entirety of the murder. And they link the phone number that the second line on Yolanda's phone plan that Kwame was using to a man by the name of Eugene Spencer, who was a very seedy character to say the least. And not only was he a kind of suspicious, violent guy, he used to live upstairs from Kwame. Kwame, before he moved out of Chicago, after the murder, lived in like a duplex type situation that his grandfather owned and rented out. So Kwame lived on the first floor. This man, Eugene Spencer, lived on the second floor. 
So of course they're looking to talk to Eugene Spencer and Kwame and about what exactly they were on the phone about, but they can't catch up to either of them. And they're like, there's no warrants out for their arrest. So they can't like bust down the door and stuff like that. Like if the two of them just don't want to talk, they don't have to, you know what I'm saying? So it's like, they're not avoiding the police, but they're not coming in to talk to them either, which is wild because Luckily enough for detectives, they're able to track Kwame down. Literally, he gets stuck on the side of the road. His car breaks down and he has like suicide doors on the car that he tricked out shortly after his mama's passing. So he sticks out like a sore thumb. An officer just, you know, pulls over to see what's going on. You know, a car with a suicide dose stuck on the side of the road. And because he's not under arrest, all they can do is urge him to come in and talk to police. And he agrees to do so because he said he'd been trying to come in and talk to the police his whole time. He said he'd been looking for the police. And the police said, well, we've been looking for you. And how you been looking for us when we be in the same spot? They don't really make much sense, does it? So that's already weird for detectives. And then they ask him about Eugene Spencer and when they mention that name, he says he has no idea who that is. They try to jog his memory by saying, you know, well, he used to live upstairs from you. And then he says, oh, well, I knew him by like his little nickname, his street name. I never really knew his government name because I don't know him like that. Which is hilarious because the little nickname that he went by is a nickname of one of my cousins. And it made me realize that I don't know that man's real name either. So Kwame is in a tough act to crack, to say the least. Once they start questioning him and once they bring up Eugene Spencer, he breaks down and he says it was just supposed to be a robbery, okay? He says that it was just supposed to be a robbery. Eugene didn't know that Curtis was gonna be there. Nobody knew because they had broken up, remember? And that's when things went left. That's how the murder happened. But Kwame admits to everything, setting his mother up to be robbed and Eugene Spencer being the one who did it. Now, detectives don't really believe this because they know from Curtis's account that Curtis woke up to gunshots and he woke up to Yolanda already being deceased, okay? So Eugene wouldn't have been startled by Curtis and that's what made him shoot. That's not what happened because Curtis said he would sleep until after the fact. So they know Kwame is involved, but they're not sure of the extent of his involvement. But now that they have Kwame's confession, they can put a full on bolo out for Eugene Spencer and scoop him up and bring him in and it takes him, and it doesn't take them long to find him. So with Kwame still in custody, they pick up Eugene, all right? And Eugene tells a slightly different story and Eugene says he is ready to tell the truth because after everything that had happened, he had only received $70 from Kwame for what they had done. $70, seven zero. When this boy is putting suicide doors on his car, Eugene Spencer only got $70. You can't be a cheap hit man. You just can't. It don't really work like that. It don't work when you pay them good. We've been here time and time again. So Eugene Spencer breaks it down from the very beginning. He says that Kwame approached him to take out his mother so that he could have the money that was in her account as well as his life insurance policy payout, okay? because Kwame had recently lost his job and he was trying to get his rap career off the ground. I shit you not. I shit you not. Okay, we're gonna talk about his rap career again, but let me finish Eugene's story, okay? So Eugene says they came up with this plan. He was supposed to go in to the apartment building and it was easy for Eugene to get in because Kwame had told his mom that he was gonna come over in the middle of the night to begin with, like he was gonna get up early, stay over, some, something, something. So she was expecting to get a call from Kwame anyway. Kwame, knowing that his mom at four o'clock in the morning would be half asleep, told Eugene to just call her and you know, muffle the phone, muffle sounds, and she would just figure, you know, okay, this must be Kwame trying to get up to the building and let him in, and that's exactly what happened. Eugene says, you know, he just kind of coughed into the phone and she buzzed him in, not knowing that she was literally letting in her murderer. 
but Kwame wasn't at the scene. Eugene Spencer was picked up and dropped off by Kwame's girlfriend at the time who says she wasn't aware of what had happened or what was going on until after the fact. Can't confirm or deny, but she did do seven years in prison for her involvement, whether she was lying or not, okay? That just blows my mind, because one thing about me, I'm gonna tell on you, bitch, because I'm not going to jail for being involved. You tell me you coming to kill somebody, I'm going to the police. I just want you to know, um, it's not going down like that. I'm going to the police. I am, I am. Hopefully there's a reward for me, but I'm not, I'll be damned if I go to jail for being an accomplice. Seven years, because I dropped you off and picked you up. And she said she didn't know this was a plot until after he got back in the car and he was bloodied. But anyway, back to Eugene's story. So Eugene says he let himself into the building with help from Kwame after Kwame had basically set his mom up, you know, telling his mom that it was gonna be him coming into the apartment. So Eugene says that he is in fact wearing the headphones because Kwame wanted to hear what was going on. And he says that he went into the bedroom shot twice okay after shooting twice he says on the phone in his earbuds Kwame tells him make sure that b-i-t-c-h make sure she is dead and he instructed Eugene to go into the kitchen and get a knife and come back okay and Eugene says that he went into the bedroom and started to stab her and he was startled by Curtis who I guess was hiding or something like that but he jumped up out of nowhere and attacked Eugene, okay? Eugene says that they do struggle for a while, but Eugene is able to bop him with the gun in the head, and this renders Curtis unconscious, and this is why the gun had fallen apart. He had hit him in the head so hard with the gun that it had fallen apart, Curtis was unconscious, and this is why there was that 14 minute period from when Eugene had left on surveillance footage, had exited the building, and Curtis calling 911. He had blacked out and didn't even know because he had been hit in the head so hard. And this is probably why he failed the lie detector test because he just didn't have a great recollection of what had happened that night because he was knocked in the head that hard. They also think that that's probably why Eugene had washed his hands and washed his feet because he just wasn't in a proper state of mind. I mean, he was knocked out cold for 15 minutes on the ground and didn't even know. And Eugene goes on to say that the original bounty on Yolanda's head that Kwame said he was gonna give him was 42 hundo, 4,200, but he never got it, just the 70. So on Christmas Eve, 2013, they arrest Kwame for the murder of his mother. as well as Eugene, and they also scoop up the girlfriend, like I said, she did her time. Kwame is sentenced to 99 years, and Eugene is sentenced to 100 by the judge. This is what the judge had to say about Kwame in the courtroom. It's quoted that Judge Stanley Sachs said, the word is matricide, meaning murder of one's own mother. Whatever he wanted, his mother gave to him, a car, a job, one could say he was spoiled. She gave Kwame life and it was his choice to take it away from her. And Kwame had a YouTube channel where he posted his music and it seems to be skits um, before and after the murder up until about six months before he was arrested. This YouTube channel is still up. The music video he made after his mother's death and he threw money, he was throwing tons of money in this little music video, which is obviously the money he got from the life insurance payout. That video was also played in court. That's how I even found out about the YouTube channel. Yeah, man, um, about to go get this thousand dollars out for the, um, for the fans, man. Really, I'm gonna take out 20,000, man. Just to show people, you feel me? I'm, I'm on a whole different level with this, man. I ain't, you know, I take this serious, man. So you can't put me in the same category as the other.
feel me, man? I don't play no games. You feel me? I don't play no games, man. You know, I do this for real. Get you out of here. I'm QC, I'm ballin', and I'm rich. Hold up. Doors on the car, go up. See a bad bitch like skirt, hold up. Take her to my home, kiss her on her neck. Get her out her thumb, but not until she's, not until she's wet. I know she wet. I'm gonna get you wet, 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 wet. I'm gonna get you wet. I'm gonna get you wet. I never been drier. But the comments on his videos are wild. Somebody said, the sad part about all of this is he killed the only one person who loved him unconditionally just to buy love from people who loved not him, but what he could do for them. His mother gave him too much. This is what happens when you spoil your children and try to cut them off to prepare them for the real world. He was used to being hand fed and wanted that to continue. Somebody else said, to this day, this guy doesn't show remorse for what he did. He truly is a lost soul. How y'all know that? Y'all was in jail together? See, I don't like half the information. You should have finished that comment with more information because how do you know that? Also noted in the comments is that the track that this little music video is playing over is not even his music. Is that true? I don't, I don't know. <laughs> Someone else said, not only was it bad that he had his mother killed, but it's downright disrespectful to be throwing her money like that to random people on the street. I mean, could someone do this? I mean, how could someone do this to their own mother? Right, which is crazy. That also reminds me, um, it said that he got more from his mother's bank account than he did in the life insurance policy payout. Mama was just stacked up at the bank and people aren't even sure if he knew about the life insurance money before the murder like he was just happy with what she had in the bank he didn't even know that other money was coming and that was just a doozy wasn't it uh, i feel bad for the family i feel bad for curtis because for a whole year after grieving his ex he was the prime suspect in her murder on top of dealing with the fact that he was there and he couldn't do anything to help but that is a wrap on today's case. Uh, it is so dark in here. I never filmed true crime this late because I'd be spooked. Okay. <laughs> but the kids are gone and this was like the only time I had to film. So thank you guys so much for watching. Make sure you subscribe before you leave and I'll see you next time. Bye guys.